That was a yes, but I got it. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Do you want to go through it? Um, yeah, because then we can transcribe it. Okay. okay. <laughs> we'll do all the work ourselves. Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so I guess we can just start off if there's anything that you kind of want to say or start off with. Um, if not, that's okay. We can go into it. But I just thought I'd let you, um, if there's anything that you want to say right away. Well, just the obvious. It's a great time of year. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a uh, renewal of life on campus. It's, it was kind of nice during the summer. I've been in uh, college campuses a lot, and the summer is a great time because you can get in all the restaurants and you can drive all around, particularly with all the construction here. On the other hand, it's it's a lot of fun to see everybody come back. It's just it's really special and see everything come back to life. And here we are this weekend with our first football game, and it's a home game, and then we've got how many, you must know, six or seven other events, athletic events going on. Yeah. A lot of alumni coming back, a lot of friends. It's just uh, and this amazing weather, with the blue skies, and the humidity has dropped. Mm -hmm. It just feels like the Big Ten yeah. fall. So it's just wonderful. It's good. And then I, it's also good to, I've been very busy. We've had a number of events in the last uh, couple of weeks with faculty mentor awards. Um, we've had several retreats with the deans and faculty trying to get a, act together for the next several years. And so it's been it's a lot of camaraderie, a lot of teamwork. It's, it's good. Nice time. Good. OK. So how are things? Now you've been in the job about, I think, 10-ish months? 10 months. Uh, actually, maybe today. Is this September 2nd? Yeah. yeah. Uh, 10 months today. Wow. OK. So how how has it been? Um, what's What's the biggest challenge, I guess, that you've seen um, in the 10 months? Uh, well, I think there have been several. I think getting our overall, our arms around um, the overall financial envelope to make sure we not know not just from one month to the next, but out, actually out over several years, how, what we're going to need. Of course, that's guided by what are we trying to get done. And I think we've, we're starting to come to a pretty strong consensus around several things most important is sort of the notion of excellence. We can't do everything, but what we do needs to be really, really, really good. And just getting that through um, and consensus on that and then figuring out the implications of that. So I think the strategic plan, the financial model have been a big step forward. I think calming everybody down as to who I am and what my values are and why I really am here, which is I, as much as I've said it, I think it took a while to set in, settle in that I really do believe intently in um, institutions like this, and they really do have an important role to play going forward. On the other hand, uh, a lot of funders have been disinvesting, and so we need to get our act together and start figuring out what plan B is and what other sources of, of revenue. So I think it's, I think people are largely calm, calmed down and realize I really am committed to it and willing to step up to some of the hard issues that we're facing. Um, and then, so I think all that's a set of issues. And then I think there's a set of issues we're also facing in terms of campus safety and all the rest and getting ourselves to what's beyond the six point plan that we've, I think, largely accomplished. But that can't be, that's a beginning, that's not the end. Um, and then also dealing with the housing on campus, some pretty sticky issues. We clearly, we don't have enough, not on campus, but also in the whole community. And so, that impacts us all, impacts prices. So um, collaborating with the faculty, collaborating with the staff, collaborating with the students and cultural houses, collaborating with the mayor and the city, and trying to open these channels of communication up and building trust and trying to say, look, we all share in this together. And um, we can continue to complain about things and dial down, or we can start really picking the things that we really think are important and uh, celebrating our success and, have, and agreeing on how to make them better. So I think we've gotten a lot done. A lot yeah. more to go. Yeah, of course. So you kind of touched on this a little bit, but the mood um, when you first got here and how it's changed. Can you talk a little bit about how you think um, how you think it happened, like uh, how it's changed and how, how you got there and what's it like now? And I guess how, how does that feel for you? Um, oh, it feels better. Um, but I, it's, it, 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 it feels better, but it feels better better because I think we're actually talking rather than screaming at one another. I have a good friend who's a journalist and he used the phrase, it's protests are great, but when's the dialogue going to begin? 
and I think that was a kind of a that was he said that a year ago, not about me, but in other things in the country. And I, I think it was a powerful phrase, which is it's one thing to protest, and I think protests do make a statement, but what's next? And to get to what's next, I think people need to trust one another and start having meaningful discussions of where their differences are and why they have differences. And sometimes they're legitimate because they have different points of view, and sometimes they're illegitimate because they don't have this, the right data. And so at any rate, starting to work at that. And so I, and I, think, I, I think part of my joining the, the, the community was caught up in that. Uh, a long history of, um, of tension between the state and the regions. Um, and I, I'm not so sure I had much to do with that, but yet I got caught up in it. And then I think having my background in terms of a business person, and clearly business people, um, must only be here to, to, to slash various activities and, and to resize and often business people, quote, don't have any values, end of quote, or don't appreciate art, or, eh, give me a break. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, I think we're beyond much of that. I think of people starting to say, no, I've got probably more artists in my family than most people would realize. I have four Mandarin speakers in my family. So I've got a multicultural background. I've got, as my wife says, whatever the student issue is, we've experienced it. And, um, so let's sit down and work with it. So I think people are calming down. And the but, I said earlier and didn't finish the thought, is yeah, it's calmed down. But now we're working on the bigger issues. And the bigger issues are um, University of Iowa long term, how do we get to excellence? We've dropped in some rankings. We need to get faculty salaries up. We need to get staff salaries. We still have some gaps there. We have some new programs that are interdisciplinary in nature where we really need to fund them, and not just fund them, but give them more power and give them more staffing and skills. We have cultural houses. We've, my book, we have largely ignored the cultural houses for quite a while. And over the summer, we got focused on that and did some short-term improvements, but now we're starting to develop uh, a series of, of visions, if you will, of what a longer-term plan might look like. I've been. In fact, I think you, you, well, you did report on it earlier this week. I've been, I spent two nights la last week with two of the four cultural houses. And I've got two more to go and others to talk to, but it, it seems like um, there's beginning to emerge some consensus of what it might look like. So those are, th that's the real work, but that's, that's how we really make a difference. Okay. So um, when you first start a new job, there's always uh, at least for me, there's always things that kind of surprise you mm -hmm. or you're not expecting. So mm -hmm. is there anything that really surprised you in this role? Uh, I, I, I think the one, you know, having talked to a lot of people, walking on campus, seeing all the backlash against me and how I was hired and all of that, left me with a, a sense that the institution had a lot of things that were really uh, lacking. And I think in how I've been here, I actually think we don't know how good we really are. I mean, there are a lot of things here that are really, really, really good. And you know, whether that be space physics or a writing or a rhetoric program or athletics or um, even some of our cultural houses, even though we haven't taken care of them for a while, their heritage and their history and the importance of that. So I, and I can keep going the longer, our, our law school going from pretty, uh, okay rankings to pretty doggone excellent rankings. Our finance program in Tippy, the pharmacy, the dental school, the medical complex. So we have a, a lot here, and I think to some extent, and then the, underneath all that, of course, are really great people. So, and there are a lot of really good people. Um, and yet we sit in an environment, all we want to do is complain. And all we want to do is say, gee, whoa, we're just not really, and you know, I, I felt like I've said publicly that I feel at times like we have a culture of, of dependency. It's a, it's a culture that says, let's go down I-80 to Des Moines and ask for more and more money because woe is us. And they, you know. Instead, I think one of the things that we need to understand is start saying, no, we can earn our way. Uh, we're doggone good. And we can actually, and people like supporting winners and people with a smile on their face rather than saying, oh, I'm just really struggling. And so one of the things that's really surprised me is the depth and breadth of the, of the, the talent and the programs that are here, and why on earth are don't we polish those off, put them up, and get going with them? And that that's 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 good news. 
That's the, so I'm really kind of psyched for a lot of us. And I think as we do that, I think people are starting to say, yeah, that may be right. And, and so we've, and in some sense, we've kind of been built ourselves into a, into a corner with some of our less than optimistic thoughts. That's a tough way to live. It's a tough way. I mean, I'm much more optimistic. I like that. And, and big challenges take great people. We got them. Let's go. Let's focus. So speaking of big challenges a little bit, there <laughs> obviously are tons of new buildings and a lot of new construction going up. Uh -huh. um, yeah. <laughs> I know where you're going. <laughs> so can I you think. give us kind of a little bit of an update um, uh -huh. on it or I guess where you hope to see it in the next few months, maybe at the end of the semester, that kind of thing? Well, um, let's, let's peel back the layers. <laughs> uh, what I thought you were going and you stopped short of, my guess is you were thinking, is, I mean, there, were, there was a period where I lived much of last year off campus, at the western side, still in Iowa City. But every day I came in as the buildings started really coming online, I started realizing, well, gee, I, it's almost I can't get into campus. And then at night I couldn't get out. So now it's like, it just, it's, it's even worse to some extent. Now I'm living on campus. So I, at one point I thought people were trying to keep me out off campus because they didn't want me in there. Now it's like I'm trapped at the house and can't get off campus because of the construction. And I think we just all need to catch a breath. Um, and we're doing all we can to, to get ahead of those. I know there are CAN bus issues. I know we're changing the traffic flows and game days. But, you know, um, unfortunately, we are where we are. Uh, we, we missed, a two, two years ago, we missed a window for the, the Buke Street construction up through there and raising that because of the floods. Um, it would have been a lot better two years ago. It, it, it didn't happen for a whole set of reasons, and that's not the university, that's the community. We're all, so, um, tough, but it's what it is. So we're doing all we can in the short term. We're putting, putting more buses on. We're trying to make sure we leave enough time for the, to allow for trans, uh, the, the traffic. I it would advise all students, particularly those in Mayflower, to maybe leave a little bit earlier. I know they don't want to hear that, but that may be the reality of what we're trying to deal with. Uh, we're trying to do all we can at Church and Dubuque because there are traffic congestions there. There's congestions out uh, on the western side of campus as well. We'll keep struggling and change bus routes, change patterns, put more time and buffer time into it. Um, but that's just where we are. Um, now, having said that, we're going to actually have on the more positive side, go to the other side. This is going to be amazing next few weeks. I and mean, we've got some of the, and I, I used to say this, and I'll repeat it, just because you may not have heard it. Lily and, the, uh, and Grace in the lab. I used to talk about when I, uh, true, when I talked to other presidents last year and asked them at the Big Ten or other institutions around the United States to say, what are you focused on? What are your big long-term concerns? They would almost always get over infrastructure because it was so antiquated. And I would never say this to them, but I was certainly thinking that, oh, we've got the other issue because we've got all an infrastructure that's gonna be 21st century infrastructure coming online here now in the next few months, uh, big time. And maybe there was a silver lining in what happened in 2008 with all the floods and all the wonderful work that people here in FEMA have done to, to bring some of these buildings back to life. But we're gonna have answer. We're going to have, we've already opened Voxman, um, haven't had the formal ceremonies in each. Uh, we're, we've got a new uh, uh, visual arts center if you haven't seen it, it's probably the only place in the world where we have uh, two of these pieces of work done by the same world-class architect right side by side with one another. They kind of play off one another. Um, we've got a new dorm opening next year, uh, which we will name next week publicly. Stay tuned. It's going to be pretty exciting where that goes. Um, we've got uh, a new addition going on to the engineering facility. Um, we've got uh, Children's Hospital opening. We'll have the public openings in, in the middle of November. Then we need to kick everyone out to sterilize the facility for a few weeks and we'll have the official opening, I think December 2nd, but don't hold me to that. Um, and then the list goes on because we're, uh, we, we need to get to an art museum, which we've announced, and it'll be next to the library. Um, where I grew up in Appalachia, I used to, when I was growing up, they, people used to talk about 
twofers, and twofers were teeth. Um, and we've got a twofer in a different context, which is we're going to get a, a, a relationship and we'll be able to put the new art museum next to the library, but also at the same time we'll be able to improve the library's HVAC systems and let the two buildings play off one another and put some of the art in the library. And so we desperately need to upgrade the archival capabilities and the, some of the labs sitting in the upper floors of the, of the library. This will give us an excuse to slip some of those investments in the library as well as get a new uh, world-class art museum. Um, and then we have Seashore, which, I don't know if you have any classes in Seashore? You're lucky. Um, it's pretty, it's, it needs help. Uh, help is, is beyond help, frankly. So we've got the region's approval to bring that down and start the process of building a new, what will be a new, new series of buildings that will build a complex on that's the east side of campus for a neurosciences center. So we'll bring some of the research and experimentation, already, excuse me, already in Seashore, we have psychology as well, a few other departments. We'll keep that in that complex and add to it some of the medical sciences around the brain, if you will. And uh, so that will, and, and I think that will be important, not just because of the building, but because of the cultural, uh, what I call scrambling the eggs, because it used to be, oh, whichever way is that away, that side of the river was the medical complex. Now it's going to be a little harder to say because it's going to be a little here and a little there, which I think starts bringing us together as more collaboratively as one institution. So uh, now I think the, the big gulp is here in the next uh, probably 120 to 200 days. Um, so the, this year will probably still be tough for traffic patterns as we get some of this work done. But I think the other work that we're going to need to do will probably be confinable and we'll be able to sort of get back to our normal lives sometime in the spring, I hope. Yeah. So um, that was actually my next question. Did I answer your question? Yeah, yeah, yeah that's okay. great. Um, okay. But kind of you mentioned the museum and then what the plans with Seashore. And um, I know in the past um, people have said that, that the way that you're thinking about those things, like not having one specific building but um, bringing different disciplines together, is um, kind of changing the culture on campus. And I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to that and kind of if you think that that is a fair statement um, and, and if that's something that you want to do. Well, I, I, think the, I think the world as I see it, um, and, and the people I've been working with on the faculty um, and the strategic planning team, the word of collaboration comes up a lot, and I'm picking it up in a lot of my comments even here today, because the world they see is one where the, the disciplines we've had in the past will still be important, but it's the interrelationship between disciplines, academic disciplines that starts becoming quite interesting. I was at a dinner last night um, with some of the, our top uh, medical researchers because they were celebrating uh, a, a, a gentleman who had, uh, was given an a, award for being the best mentor and, and, and to, to graduate students in the medical area. And so there were probably about 30 people there and the topic of conversation became the intertwining of these disciplines. I mean, and one person who was Nobel laureate, by the way, who came here from the University of Colorado and grew up here in Iowa City, and he spoke yesterday at some of the high schools and, and here on campus. But his point was, he started describing his own lab and one of the, the labs he has, and he's doing medical research, and he listed all the disciplines of the people, graduate students in his lab, and he, you couldn't find the, word, the M word the medical word in there. They were engineers, they were biologists, they were, and, and as you went through this, we kind of also said, wow, we really have scrambled these eggs. So yeah, I think it's from a strategic perspective, a lot that we're gonna be facing going forward is making sure that the right people rub shoulders together and it's a natural phenomenon rather than having to get up and walk someplace else and it's a physical effort. And, and actually, I think sparks might fly creatively and from an innovative perspective. In that context, I believe architecture makes a difference in those types of things. And we ought to use architecture to our advantage. And also location, obviously, is a piece of that. So yeah, I think we're, we're facing a world where we'll respect the disciplines, because you need to have the grounding. 
at the same time will celebrate the interrelationship and intermingling between them. And several places around the country have done similar things. It's a little bit, in a, in a crude way, it's a little bit like an art museum and a library will be the third institution around the world that has formally put them together in a way. Uh, one's Edinburgh in uh, Scotland and the other is in some place in Germany, I forgot the name of it. Yeah, you don't do those things um, as accidents. You do them purposely and then they start interplaying with one another and great things happen. So that's, that's our expectation. And at the, at the end of the day, if no great things happen and we just still have our silos, we'll be great at that as well. But I think we're looking for something special on top of all that. Okay. Um, so in past interviews with us, um, you've talked a little bit about thinking about moving money, excess money from the athletics department to the other side of the river where there's this general student population. And I was wondering if, um, if there's still that conversation happening and, and where it's at now and kind of what you're thinking with that. It's continuing to evolve. I mean, the, 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 the basic thought is um, that I think every pocket of the university should have its own philanthropic activities. We've had Dance Marathon for what, 20, it's going to 23rd year or so-ish, I think, mm -hmm. is that right? Yeah. The 23rd year? Yeah. And gee, good Lord, the students have enough that they do already in their lives, and they certainly don't have a lot of excess cash, and they certainly don't need to spend all the time that they do on dance marathon, but yet they do, and they have 23 years, and I think it's been wonderful for the students. It's actually, one of the things you learn in philanthropy is sometimes as you give, you get more than what you actually give out of it in terms of uh, experience and support and friendship. So it's in the same context that I say, you know, we need to have that sort of philosophy. That's a core part of our culture. Right, and we need to continue it, continue it. So hey, athletics, you know, what is yours? And what is it you really should support? And I think part of that is fiscally, part of it's with your time. And they are actually fully embracing that. They've had several discussions, um, you know, and they already do to, to a large extent with our, which is what, back behind me, the, our, our student recreation facility. They manage that, they run that, they staff that. Um, so they've already stepped up to that. Do they want to do that more? Um, what about uh, endowing certain faculty chairs that, of people who really teach a lot of student athletes and really support them? What about campus safety? What about some of the cultural houses? So I've, I've stayed out of the issue of picking it because I think part of the process of, of, of helping them get there is that they own it. And so, so I bought, all I've said is, what is it? And they're working it, and I think it will happen. I don't think there's any doubt. By the way, we're not the only institution in the United States that's been doing that. And Ohio State's been doing this for quite a while. Several other institutions, I think Purdue does some of it. Purdue's program is much smaller. I think their athletic department is probably 70 to 80 million dollars in total. Ours is over 100 million. Ohio State's 160, you know. So, yeah, I think it's just being holistic and systemic in it. Um, stay tuned. Okay, great. Let's see. Um, can I ask um, yeah, so overall, for your vision of the athletics department, how should it expand? Are there any sports that you should, that you think should be getting other attention? Um, I would, I'll, give the, I'll probably give the same answer in terms of the overall student body. I mean, excellence means you really take really good care of what you've already got, and you don't go further until you make sure you've, what you've got is really, really strong. And we've got 24 sports. I, I think we're continually assessing it, but there are no plans to go beyond 24. Um, and, and we've got to be very, very careful um, because some of those some of the sports are pretty expensive to add. So, no, I think we're quite comfortable with where we are in terms of number of sports. On the other hand, the fan experience um, and continuing to improve the performance on the field, the, the coaching, the recovery times, the sports medicine side of all that for the 24 sports we have, um, we can continue to improve on. In terms of facilities um, for some of the sports, is there any Thing that you see um, could happen in the future for improving some of the facilities, um, not for football or things like that, but for some of the other sports? Yeah, I, 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 to the best of my knowledge, there are no specific plans that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that I know of, um, but I'm sure they're, they're working. And I know there's some discussions about 
that will come up here next week about um, the golf course, the clubhouse is pretty antiquated. I think that's in the docket, the beginning part of that. Um, we're one of the few Big Ten schools that only has one golf course. Um, and the, the clubhouse is pretty antiquated. So yes, that'll get done. There's some discussion about the Olympic sports uh, out in the Coralville area, north of campus out that way, of how to improve, continue to improve those facilities. Um, but nothing like Greenfield, big major. I've had some frustrations with the, just me personally, that talked about this isn't quite a sport, but our, um, it just seems, feels like to me that our uh, Hall of Fame is too far from campus and probably get parking out there, but yet it doesn't seem like you get the foot traffic, so where else should it be, could it be? And we've got some incredible things to say about sports and the history of sports in this campus, and it just seems like it's still too removed from us. So things like that, but these are adjustments. Okay, so kind of switching tracks a little bit. Um, but so a few weeks ago, the UI chose to disband the bias assessment and response team. Um, so I guess I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about what was your position on that team and just a little bit about that. Uh, I'm not on that team. I've, I've met with various members several, several times. But I think your beginning premise is, is mistaken, okay. uh, which is, and, and I know why you say it, because there was a, an article that came out, oh, three weeks ago. Mm -hmm roughly, that said the headline was that we, and I forgot exactly the headline, but the effect was that we decided not to move forward with a bias assessment or response team. Mm -hmm. But then if you read down into the article, mm -hmm. it got deeper and deeper and deeper into the nuances that the team is actually still working on. Mm -hmm. So I saw the headline that same evening, and I mm -hmm. actually called somebody and said, what meeting did I miss? Because I didn't know we'd made that decision. Indeed, we had not made that decision. I think it was an unfortunate, sometimes I've learned in journalism that the people who write the articles are different than the people who pick the headlines. I'm sure that's not true, the Daily Eye one. <laughs> and if it is true, then I'm sure there's a close working connection between the two. So I think the headline was an unfortunate uh, misrepresentation of where we are. This is a tough set of issues. Yeah. And the country's dealing with it. Right. And, and it. and it's an issue of First Amendment freedom of speech there's academic freedom, there's student learning and creating positive student learning environments, as well as microaggression and how we deal with that, and all that's in here. And I think if you actually go to any one corner and leave other issues behind, you can, you can say, well, I know how to do that. But the question is, hey, do all three or three or four of those things all at the same time? And it's not easy. And then on top of it, I think the most important thing, which I'm really proud of what we're doing, relative to some of the things, and I have to be careful, when I read things now about what other institutions are doing, I'm actually reading them a little bit with some degree of jaundice because I know what happens with the headline, so maybe what I'm reading is also not true. But um, we're doing it in a very collaborative, very careful process with all elements of shared governance. So in the team that's been working on this, the administration's been in there, the faculty have been in there, the uh, staff have been in there, students have been in this process, and on top of it, we have a couple subject matter experts here at the law school and a couple other places who really do know what they're talking about when they get to creating positive teaching environments, First Amendment, legal issues, and so they've been working it since sometime last spring. So we will do something. I think the answer is not going to be, use a double negative, I'm going to more get rid of the, the double negative. We, we will do something. And what that will be, I don't know. I know they're getting closer and closer. What it will be called, I don't know. I, I must say, I, and I've said this to people working on it, the notion of biased assessment response team sounds a little aggressive and a little in your face, I, you know. So I'm not so sure I would pick those same set of words to describe this. But clearly there needs to be some process for um, adjudication or dealing with people who feel like they've been offended. On the other hand, how far that goes into the classroom and how, you know, so here we go, into those issues. They're working it, we'll, we'll get through it, um, and we will do something. So the notion that we won't, not true. So you mentioned a little bit how this is an issue across the country. So um, 
when so the letter that was sent to University of Chicago students, yep. um, do you think that affects like did that affect how you how you look at the University of Iowa and our campus? Because I know you mentioned when you read other what other institutions are doing, how did that affect kind of what you're seeing here? Well, I, I, I'm still curious because again, I don't fully know all the facts in Chicago, and I, I think the right like the way I think about these things is what's good for the University of Chicago may not be at all good here in Iowa City. Or what's good actually at the University of Iowa may not be good for Iowa State. There's a very different culture, very different campuses, and I think we need to find our solution to this. Um, when I read the article in the Chronicle of Higher Education, specifically on Chicago, I was fascinated that it seemed to be the administration through the provost's office that the letter came from. And it didn't seem to me, and again, be careful, it didn't seem to me that other elements of the shared governance process were in that letter and had been worked through that. We're not going to let that happen, if, if that's right, we're not going to let that happen here. Subsequent to that letter coming out last week sometime, I think, it seems like their campus, the faculty, for example, are now into the conversation and are troubled by the letter, which again suggests to me they didn't work it as a team. That's not what's happening here. We're working it as a team. Um, so. It, it reinforced in my mind the difficulty of the issue and the importance to work it through the entire shared governance communities in a collaborative way. And it also reinforced in my mind that we shouldn't rush this. If we try to, if we actually say, no, we got to get it out because everyone really needs it and we end up making some mistakes here, um, it's not healthy not healthy. And I think some of the biggest mistakes organizations in general make is they come to premature decisions and then they have trouble executing them because everybody says, no, nah, they didn't quite what we meant. So we need to we need to get through the whole process. Okay. All right, those are basically all the questions we have. Um, just one last thing. Uh, this is kind of just a couple people in, in the DIY were just asking us to ask you these questions, but uh, just like, were you a college football fan before you started working here? And does working here make you a bigger football fan? Well, I've always enjoyed a lot of sports, so I'm a sports, I believe in sports, I, um, I've been a, an athlete, um, and I, all my kids are athletes, my grand, some of my grandkids are now starting the process. I believe a lot in sports, I believe in it uh, because I think it's a really, really good set of disciplines, I think it's also really good for the, for the body and all the others, so, I, and I watch a lot of sports, as my, and my wife will say. In fact, I have a good friend who actually said to me the other day, you know, I think a, 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 a good portion of America, if it actually gave up watching sports on TV, would find whole new lives. Uh, and I think that's probably true, and I'm kind of guilty of the same thing. But so, um, now, I probably, I don't think I watch any more college football than I did before, is probably the honest answer. But I think I watch a lot more Iowa football than I did before. <laughs> yeah. Um, and you know, so far enjoyed every moment of it you know, after last year. And even the the two losses in their own way, the, the the Michigan State game, I think will go down as one of the better football games in history. Period. It was just spectacular. Didn't turn out quite the right way at the end. But you know, that's sports. If you ever played sports, you don't win them all. It's what you do with the the experience for the next game. And then Rose Bowl actually was the 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 worst three hours. I've experienced, but it was the best three days. I mean, it was just so much fellowship and so much camaraderie. Um, and I can even say the same thing for, for Indianapolis. I mean, there were more Hawkeyes who came further away to get to Indianapolis than the people from Lansing, or East Lansing, down there. And we just owned the town. It was fun. And then we almost striped the field, right, yeah. if you were there that night. And the same thing with the Rose Bowl. It was just a great time, and even though we lost a game, I think uh, Kirk and the coaching staff need to figure out, you know, what's the next step and how they uh, build on those experiences. And I know Kirk's already been open. I've had several discussions with him, and I know he's really thinking about it. So um, long answer to your question is big, long-time sports fan, even more of a Hawkeye fan now mm -hmm. in all the sports. And I've, you know, I've been to gymnastics, men and women's, last year. I've been to wrestling. I've been to a baseball game. Uh, I played golf and I wanted to get out to the golf, but I couldn't. The one day I wanted to go, and I was all set to go, was the, the final day of the tournament that was held here. And it was just pouring in rain. And 
I, mean, I played in those types of days, and I, I don't want I don't want to be a tourist in those days. <laughs> when it was just long, continual rain. Mm -hmm. So what else? Been in men's basketball, women's basketball. So I'll keep doing it. And I, actually, some people get say, "Well, don't you have another job?" Yeah, I have another job. But this is um, we all need relief. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Plus, somebody, some, some of us, somebody's got to cheer them on. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Exactly. Okay. okay, those are all the questions we have. Is there anything you want to add real quick or anything else that you think that we No, it's just, uh, you know, here we go. It's going to be a great couple of months because we got uh, all these buildings opening, all these openings, okay. and then we have football coming back and uh, some other sports coming up as well. The soccer team looks like they're off to a great start. Yeah. So, go Hawks. It's the last thing. Thank <laughs> great. you. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Of course.